This is the end of how long in this place? I, I came here 25 years ago uh -huh. and it was the most unbelievably desolate place because there were no proper windows at the far end, mm. they were just bars and it had become a pigeon loft and I don't know how many years it had been used as a pigeon loft. Mm -hmm. And underneath all these beams there were piles of pigeon manure. <laughs> the cisterns in all the toilets had been used as pigeon nests. And the stairs, the stairs, the 50 stairs leading up to this place were just deep in pigeon manure and dead pigeons. And it stank. It hadn't been used for many years, huh? No. So how's it been here? Well, it took me about 10 minutes or perhaps less for me to realise that this was an amazing place. Mm. And I had a, a horrific job to clean it up and, and make it habitable. Right. In fact, I spent from the October of 1973 to February 1974 before I actually opened the school, getting it equipped and uh -huh. clean. In fact, I painted the entire building and I couldn't afford paint, so I used a thin par plaster Paris. I just sloshed that off. Uh -huh. what, I, what I discovered was that I knew how to do things, but I almost had to relearn them in order to be able to tell other people how to do them. Mm. Things that I would have done quite unconsciously, mm. automatically, without even thinking, mm. when it came to explaining to other people how to do them, I had to re-experience the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It was quite, a, quite marvelous. And how about this space? I mean, the distance between the students, the, the feel of it, because we're in this space now and we're celebrating yeah. this space. Yes, well, the wonderful thing about this place is that there were nooks and crannies. There were places that people could tuck themselves into to do the things. And there were places that had special light. There, were, there was an odd, odd place that had a top light. Mm -hmm. And there were very some places that had that beautiful, strong side light. And that light mm -hmm. would change uh -huh. uh, in the course of the day. And so it was, it was just a magnificent, the whole place was like a light machine that we understood and knew what it would do. And often I would see a student struggling and I'd say, try this other light. And we'd move along to the other light and they'd see mm -hmm. all, all that they needed to see. Uh -huh. It was not being revealed in would, the light. They'd area. move their piece, would they? Oh yes, on their stand. Because yeah. one of the things I introduced here, which was quite, new and never I'd never seen it in an art school here all my all my modeling stands were mobile oh. so everything could move it used to move round and round it could move from place to place and everything was mobile I, I actually designed these stands in such a way that they could be moved in every direction up and down round and round and from place to place with the greatest of ease and of course this is due to the radical difference between painting and sculpture. With painting, mm. you set the subject up and you mm. screw yourself down in a certain position and you stay there until the painting's finished. Yes. But with sculpture, you're constantly on the move. And why, it, why is that? To get different light or to see Oh, different... and to see the thing as a full three-dimensional thing. And this, how many students did you put into this space on the, on the average? Oh, I think 15 students in a class would have been a, a maximum. When I began, I had up to 30 people mm. in a class. But really, th that was not the way I wanted it to mm -hmm. be. Uh, I settled down, and, uh, and the way I teach, which was highly individual teaching, one-to-one mm. -one teaching, yeah. uh, you know, I really couldn't manage more, more than 15, that was an absolute maximum. Mm. And your technique is to move from person to person? Eh? From well, I just, I just circulate around the class. 
and go from one person to another. I observe what they're doing, and yeah. when I see they're floundering, their difficulties, mm. I go along and talk to them about it. So really look at this and get your shape. Check the whole thing to be sure that that th this thing really is the shape you want it to be. And, and then come round here and look at what shape that needs to be in relation to, to that shape. Right? But you actually will change things for them, won't you? I mean, oh yes, I sometimes demonstrate on, the, on mm -hmm. the work. See, I'm not talking about make it, by trying to, to make it realistic. I'm just talking about a shape, a completely abstract thing, mm -hmm. see? which is a more direct and um, effective way yeah. of helping the student um, than all the words in the world mm. is to be able to see something done. If you come around here behind me and see what I'm doing, the student, I'd come back a few minutes later and be gone. <laughs> they would have obliterated. Yes. So look to find the significant things and put them in. Don't just sort of try to make it up. <laughs> okay. Sometimes in sculpture you see people do things even when they're not aware that they're doing them. Mm. For example, when they move to another aspect and start to do something, they're actually obliterating something that has already been done. Mm. And that's, that's the incredibly complex and difficult thing mm. about sculpture. Bruce told me that he couldn't get the face, that you got the face for him. Yeah. Make a face, you know, and it was, you know, well, it's hard to say now, but it was much flatter and the stru bone structure was, wasn't right. Yeah. And he just go, oh, no, that's not a mouth. That's just a set of lips, and he just can rip the whole thing off. <laughs> See, it's a structure. It's the whole shape of the jaw. Boom, 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 boom. And <laughs> he was about, right. In about 30 seconds, he could create what I just failed to create in an hour. So uh, It right. does look good, though, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I, was, I was very happy. The hair's mine. The forehead's mine. And the other. Yeah. Yes. I, I did quite a lot. <laughs> Um, and that was a ridiculously ambitious thing that he undertook, you know. Yeah. But it turned out pretty well. Oh, it? yes, yes. His first one was excellent too. Yeah. yeah. He enjoyed himself, yeah. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Do you often get people from, like himself, a TV executive? Oh, from, yes. From strangers' they, backgrounds? That's right. Great majority of people are, are not necessarily going to be professional sculptors or ever intended uh -huh. to be. So yeah. this is a relief from another life, is it, or escape from another life? Yes, it, it's... Uh, people have the need to do something, mm. something other than the thing that they ordinarily do. Yeah. Um, everybody that comes has the experience of seeing things differently. Mm. You know, that what I often say that people just look, they don't see. Mm. You know, we just look to get our food into our mouths or mm. to read a newspaper or to get across the street. It's or a sort of pragmatic it's, it's, And it's un, unthinking, it's automatic, you mm. know, it's just something we do, but seeing, to really see something. Yeah. Now, there's a fullness about that lip, bottom lip. Mm. Can you see those two sort of mounds? Yeah, yeah. We need them. And, and that top, top lip it's got a beautiful fullness to it. Yeah. And it's got, then it's got this, this beautiful edge, mm. right, which you'll no doubt get. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And he still looks a bit down in the mouth. I want to see this hint of a smile. 
see the how that's got just that hint, which would make such a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lovely. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> The master's touch. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> he sees more with one eye than most people with two. <laughs> I remember the year before I began this school, and the, this is part of the reason why I decided I should do it. I was teaching the life study at the National Art School. And one day I was watching a student who walked out and looked fixedly at the model for quite a long time and then walked back and put a little pea of clay on the... And I thought to myself, now I wonder what the connection between his going out there and looking and doing that is. So after he'd done it two or three times, I stopped him on the way back and I said, what did you actually see when you went out there? And uh, he looked at me askance, as though, was I supposed to see something? <laughs> and uh, so I, at that point, I realized the, the value and the importance of seeing. And so when I'm teaching in the life study, mm. I say to people, they have to not only look at what they're, and see what they're seeing, but they have to tell themselves what they've seen. So that if I stop them on the way back and say, what did you see? They can tell me what they've seen. That's good. And then there's a step beyond that, where having fixed it in your mind, what you've actually seen, to be able to translate uh -huh. that seeing into what you will do, how you will express mm. it in clay. Can you see that's a yes, huge step? I can. And in fact, ideally, the student will do that with their back turned to the model. Because it's what is in their mind that is getting onto the work, you see? Mm. Not what's out there. Yes. And so many people have got this fixation that it's, it's just their hand, and this object out mm. here, so and their mind thing. never gets into it. Uh huh. Yeah. But you have to take it back through your mind. Right. So that's a, a huge part of what we do. What happens with them, uh, students emotionally? Do some of them really get into their shells and sort of creep into the corner? And oh yes, um, you, you will get all kinds of responses to that. There are some people that are, are so appalled uh, at the. Uh, at the, gu the gulf between what they think they can do and what they can actually do, that yeah. it's, al it's almost too devastating, they have to go away. Uh -huh. um, and then other people have a sort of crisis and we work through it and they get over it and then finally get to, to, to do it. Um, I have a saying that I use with the students. Uh, I mean, one day I walked up to a student who was uh, having a terrible battle with themselves because already previously I had explained this thing mm. to them. So by my explaining it, they really thought they knew it. <laughs> See? And I had to say, knowing is not being. You have to become what you know. Mm -hmm. And to, in order to become what you know, you have to be very patient. Mm. And it's a gradual process. Mm. The, the knowledge gradually builds up in you to the point where you have become what you know. And you do it, you do it from that deep, almost body knowledge physical yes. knowledge. Right, that's wonderful. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a very strange business uh, for the artist, getting it right. Often, 
an artist will get something right and they don't even know that they've done it. Mm -hmm. Because and the reason why it's difficult for them to do this is that they've got something fixed in their minds that is different from what they've done. Mm -hmm. And what they've done can sometimes be better than what was fixed in their minds. And, and it's only sometimes late, sometime later that they actually realise what they've done. So your job is often to say when to stop? Um, is it? Yes. Um, I, I'm, th I'm thinking of one student who is very, a very good student but is obsessed with detail and goes on and on and on tinkering with the form and with the detail of the thing to the point where it, it's, it's, it, it has a stultifying effect. Mm. Um, the, the thing loses vitality mm. because of the, this enormous uh, preoccupation with detail. Mm -hmm. Whereas the best work is often done with great vigour and spontaneity and, uh, and a statement will be made with, with wonderful brevity mm. that is not fussy. You know, um, and this is another great thing that I have to teach and that is that to begin with when we look at a thing all we can see is the details of it mm -hmm. whereas the thing that really makes a thing significant is not the detail but it's the big elements the big process mm -hmm. um, to see the relationship between one form and another, to see the rhythm and the harmony and the proportions of a thing. Now, when you're looking at all the detail, you don't see that. No. And it's not until you've got to the point of realising the, the actual, the, the reality of these other things, these relationships of forms and mm. rhythmical, processes and all those things that then we can we can give up or or let go of that preoccupation with detail. Yeah. Mm. No, that makes good sense. Mm.